thanks for coming out, folks. Thanks for making time. You could be doing so many other things, but you're here. And thanks, Edwin, for trying. You know, you, you did good. My name is Dami Larry Fagrimi, and I'm here to talk to you. We're, we're here to talk together about secure design, particularly looking at the IoT space and looking at security usability, the challenges and the concerns. Um, I was in the last session talking about culture and all that research. I don't know if you were in that session talking about culture, but I think that some of that will play into even what we talk about right now. So for status, a little bit about me. So I'm a security architect at Intel Corporation in the U.S. in Arizona. Um, I work on with teams in terms of secure design for IoT mobile web applications. Uh, we recently released this book about the IoT, a guide to security and privacy, attaining security and privacy for IoT products. Um, I've been a leader at OWASP in Nigeria. I'm originally from Nigeria and West Africa. And I blogged there, used to run a software company in the previously, but it's not even about me at all. Who cares, right? Blah, blah, blah. It's not about me. So now let's go forward. The, the law is really set to say, hey, I'm not representing Intel at this point. I'm talking for myself. We're talking together. So what are our learning objectives? What, what are the outcomes we hope to, we're hoping for in terms of this session? We're talking about security usability. I want to get a better understanding of the need for security usability in IoT. We want to get a better understanding as well of the challenges of IoT security usability. And then we'll look at some principles regarding how we design usable IoT security. <coughs> so let's set the stage. The first thing is that research shows that good users do bad things. As anyone, <laughs> as, does anyone here know Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde? Anyone? So it seems that we've got a bit of a, is this split personality in terms of good users doing bad things? The question for us then is, why do good users do bad things as far as using security? Has anyone ever written any cool tool? Or developed any cool tool that they're proud of? Anyone? No one? <laughs> okay, yes, you should, you should put your hand up. Anyone written any, worked on any cool project? Okay, okay, <laughs> all right. And you should be proud of it. We worked on cool t tools, we built cool things. But I guess the point I've been trying to make before I show the next slide is sometimes we we're excited about, shall I even say, the sexiness of our code or the security feature that we're developing. And we're trying to understand, okay, how does that translate into the actual usage? Has anyone tried to tell their kids about, perhaps if you've got kids or friends who don't work in tech or don't work in security, about that really cool tool that you just built? And they're like, yeah. Why is that? Most times, people are think, most people who are not security professionals who are using tools that we build, they're thinking, can this tool just work already? Can this product just work already? If I'm thinking about a smart home, as we'll talk about later on, I want to use a product, an IoT product. I'm thinking primarily about what it does for me. I want to open the garage door. I'm thinking most importantly about just getting the garage door open. Can the tool just work already? And maybe your heart has just fallen a little bit when you hear that. But this is my, what I'll say to you. Put your head up. We're special forces and not pop stars. What do I mean by we're special forces? Y'all are talented security professionals in different areas of security, most likely. When we look at special forces, for instance, the Netherlands or the U.S. where I'm from, where I live right now, or Nigeria where I'm from, you go out and do some, you, you, people go to war, for instance, hopefully not because of praise and glory, but because you care about the people that you're trying to protect. So my challenge is that hopefully you also care about 
those who use your product. So it's okay if not everyone is enamored about the specific security feature. That's not what you're out there to do. You're out there to make the products more secure to you so that people can be safe. Now, what if we ignore security usability? Let's take a scenario with you're going to the office on Monday. You've got to be at the office, say, by 9 o'clock. But you've got this particular car that you get to use, so you've come out at even, let's say, 6 o'clock. You've got to be in the car at 6 o'clock. In this particular car that you're using, from the driver's seat, you can see the engine in full display. It's just that kind of car. So now the first thing you have to do is you've got this really cool tool, an electrical tool, so you apply some electric currents to the solenoid. Now the solenoid, or to the starter switch actually, the starter switch then sends some electrical current to the solenoid. The solenoid attracts some iron rod which closes the circuit from the starter switch to the battery. And afterwards, now the starter motor comes on and begins to turn your engine. And you're there, as the engine is turning, you gotta watch real closely, the engine shouldn't turn too much, elsewise, the engine could go bad. So as the startup motor is turning your engine, you quickly flick the iron rod to turn off the electricity going to the startup motor. And then what happens then, your engine is now has come to life and you're able, you now have to drive this thing. You must be asking yourself the question, why would anyone go through such gyration to drive a car? I dare say though, that will, mightn't be that what, mightn't be that, mightn't that be the case if cars were built solely by mechanical engineers? If mechanical engineers were the ones who are solely responsible for building and releasing the car, it would be a great car. It would be a cool car. Well, thankfully, we have other people looking at the aesthetics as well, such that I, who am not a mechanical engineering savant, can use the car, and it just works. What about the IoT space? IoT is interesting that it drastically increases the amount of devices that one person has got to care about with regards to security. So before we perhaps had, we could say one computer, perhaps a desktop. These days now we have multiple computers, maybe a few computers. When we think about a smart home, we're thinking about perhaps 40 computers. We could just use 40 as a number. That one individual who's probably not a security professional has got to keep secure. Secure maintenance, secure configuration, it becomes a nightmare for people who just want the product to work. Unless, what about factories, nuclear factories, nuclear reactors, smart cities? We're talking billions and millions of devices. How does secure usability come into play in such scenarios whereby you've, there are too many things for us, for people who are maintaining those systems, um, to struggle through secure configuration for individual systems or individual devices. Now we'll talk about challenges of security usability and then we'll go into some principles. The first one is what I call the five C's in terms of challenges of security usability. And the first is security doesn't make sense to the regular user. So let's consider for instance Sandy with a pacemaker. Sandy has got a pacemaker that helps regulate a heartbeat. The pacemaker connects to a hub at home or in our office, which can be remotely used to administer the pacemaker. How many of us have heard about this issue whereby there was a pacemaker that was already deployed in people's hearts, essentially, but suddenly people had this, at least one or two people, had this weird experience where their hearts were beating faster. And that, what's going on? It, maybe it's just in the night, in the day, whatever. And your heart is beating fast. And it turned out that the manufacturer was running tests on their heart. Anyone heard that about our story? 
Am I the other one? Can you manufacture running tests in your heart? Now, this is the interesting thing. If you put something in most people's hearts, they're assuming you know what you're doing. I mean, it's in my heart. If it's in my heart, I'm assuming there are two things that happen then when I say the regular user, security doesn't make sense. The first one is assuming that the experts are the experts. Sandy has also perhaps got a mobile phone that she can use to communicate or at least monitor the pacemaker via the same hub. There's an option as well for Sandy to restrict the connectivity to the hub such that no one can actually reach a hub or to ensure that the mobile phone, only her mobile phone, can be used to connect to a heart. But odds are, for most people, if you put it in my heart and you put that device there, you probably know what you're doing, and it's good. The second reality, or the second likelihood, I should say, for for this first C, is that is what we call the Kruger-Dunning paradox, which is the less people know the more they think they know, right? So in this case, someone is saying, okay, I've got this pacemaker, I've got this hub in, the, in my home. Well, I'm an engineer. I wire the circuits in this house. I've checked this device. It's good. I've got friends and colleagues who up to today will not drive or use any car that has got internet connectivity, they just don't want to use any car like that. I guess the paranoia of knowing what is possible takes them to the other extreme. Whereas in some cases, we know a little and we think we know more than we know. The second C, the second C has to do with security not being the objective of the regular user, a repetition of what I said in the past. And the message here really is seat belts. Assuming the security were the objective of the regular user or a priority, why do we need seatbelt laws? So the, the, the graphic that's just showing different countries with seatbelt laws and the fact that in fact many of those, some of those countries have, as it's said here, only a quarter of all the countries report full enforcement of seatbelt laws. Now I've got an interesting little story my brother is a very cool guy. He makes music, and he's also a computer scientist. At least I think he's a cool guy. But in some parts of Nigeria, the parts of Nigeria where you, you don't, you should use a seatbelt, but there's no one to enforce it in certain sections. So sometimes I'm driving in Arizona, and I'm just thinking, my brother sometimes doesn't use seatbelts. And I'm driving, and I'm thinking, I hope my brother's wearing a seatbelt today. Perhaps, I don't know if my brother likes to live dangerously, or do we like to live dangerously? So really the message there being that security is not the primary objective most times for most users. We don't demand usable security from vendors. The problem being that those of us who use security tools I'm not exactly sure about how much it costs us to use the security features. For instance, it be security com configuring um, the secure connection from a IoT hub to the cloud. What is the cost of using the security feature in that tool or in that product? There is no measurement. And likewise, the, the research arm of vendors who put out security tools and the marketing department, shall I say, there's little research about the cost of using security. And that flows then into the producers. There is no, it's no one's problem, so to speak, as to making sure the cost comes down for using the right security. The fourth C is a barrier to necessary workflow. So we have the diagram here, someone who's trying to configure a sensor's connection to a sensor hub and having to go through a maze to do that. Research shows that barriers to necessary work are one of the topmost reasons why security is bypassed. Now let's assume, for instance, you're trying to connect a sensor to a sensor hub, and the sensor hub only allows authentication with TLS certificates. 
someone who doesn't, who is using it, some sensors, low form factor sensors do not support TLS authentication, and someone who's trying to connect such a sensor to a sensor hub is most likely going to do one of two things, or if packs, even most likely one thing, which is turn off, yes, just turn it off. So the challenge then becomes, how do you design such a sensor hub such that it supports the other use cases aside the use case where TLS um, is, is workable? Or how do you automate the detection of other um, mechanisms of detecting what is supported by the endpoint or the client that is trying to connect to the sensor hub? If it's difficult to use, most people will turn it off. <coughs> From the executives down through to the user, there are different views of security. We can talk about the executives being the folks who have this vision about how you take the talent pool and use that with regards to what the customers need to produce a product that helps to improve revenue. And now the architect being saddled with designing through that vision to actually release a product and the engineer partnering with the architect to bring that design to reality and the user who now has got to use this, the product. Different views of security. Challenge then being for security professionals to harmonize security across the different views. So from the vision through the design and the implementation, the next step then is what about the user's view of your security product or security tool as well? It takes us into what I call the 10 Ps in terms of principles for secure design, and I'm specifically speaking to usability for secure design IoT. <laughs> the first one is put on user hat, which essentially means remembering just all the things that I talked about. For instance, security perhaps not being the most important thing for the user who's using this product. And the next one is secure defaults only. Now this is, how shall I say, not new. Um, in fact, it's, as it's best called a regular secure design principle. When we consider the IoT use case and consider the millions of devices that have to be secured or the 40 devices in a smart home, if the product doesn't come out of the box operating securely, it most likely wouldn't be used securely. So the example here speaks to device that has to connect an IoT edge device that has got to connect to the cloud. And we give the example of secure boot whereby the device as it comes up is able to verify that the software that it's running is signed by a trusted authority um, and has th those, the, the parameters that are used to verify that the cryptographic key is stored securely on that device. The question then becomes for IoT, many IoT devices are on for long periods, on for months, on for years. How do we ensure that we're able to periodically check that the IoT device is still running software that is trusted? Another example of secure defaults here would just be, we, we, we have, uh, we, in terms of a smart home, you could think of the ring devices or the cameras that let you see who's come um, to the door. It should just be HTTPS. So this is not new, mostly a regular secure design principle. Something else that we often come across is people referring to networks as, okay, we've got a factory network, or we've got a corporate network, and I'm trying to deploy this device into those networks, and I'm saying, okay, we don't need, for instance, to make sure this traffic is encrypted because it's, shall we say, a trusted network. So the message here really is that there are no trusted network. NSA research, which is in the comments on the slide, tells us that you should perhaps assume that any network that you're running is already compromised. So you're running your products within a network with the assumption that sophisticated attackers most likely want to be undetected in that network. So shall it be a factory network, industrial network, um, an agriculture farm network, a corporate land network, a home network? There are no trusted networks. So we don't get to mark off some um, items in terms of security or, or traffic or secure design as not necessary in some networks. 
if we understand that most users are not as savvy as we are, how do we help the user to set up a system? And this startup principles, the 10 Ps, are to help us just start that journey. That's why I call them startup principles. This principle speaks to targeted risk information. So how do I aid the user who's setting up a system so they understand the risk of the choices that they make? So here you're trying to set up, once again, an edge device to an IoT cloud, and you're trying to select authentication options. So we're saying, okay, um, are we using mutual authentication, TLS, in the first option? Are we using pre-shared symmetric keys? If the user, for whatever reason, decides to choose one option, how do you pro provide information that helps them make a better decision. In this case, saying, hey, if you're using shared symmetric keys, you're having the same key in multiple locations, and that increases the risk of compromise. That's related to this next principle, where we're trying to aid the user with pre-configured, uh, pre-selected configuration buckets. So once again, picking back off that example, connecting an IoT Edge device to an IoT cloud, and now the option is for the user to select the security level of their environment. Like we said before, there are no trusted networks. So even if it be a corporate LAN or a home LAN, we still say in this example that it's perhaps medium security for corporate LANs and for home LANs. Or high, high security uh, risk for communication from the IoT hub to the cloud in an internet type scenario. And if one option is selected, we're then able to m automatically select another option, really just pre-configured buckets of security controls for users. At P5, we're talking about designing to scale. The scale at which we run in the IoT space ensures leads to a difficulty with, with people making, um, having to configure individual devices. So this example here talks about zero-touch device provisioning, whereby you're trying to ensure that when a product comes out the box, it's able to, through secure means, contact the right IoT cloud backend via the IoT device key that I've been registered in the backend. Um, now the, the IoT device key is also born in by the manufacturer, in this case, into the device. So you bring out the IoT device and it has the ability now to phone home to the IoT cloud backend and through establish a TLS, mutual authentication TLS channel, such that it can download the right configuration and the device comes up. So in this case, it could be that one is deploying 5, 10, 50, 10, 100, have a number of devices, but the device coming out of the box is able to get the right configuration by default. The second example here is talking to the cloud really talking about design to scale as well, whereby in this example, we've got an IoT smart city backend, but outside of the smart city specifics, you're just trying to ensure that as the device comes up and sends traffic for the first time to the cloud backend, the cloud is able to identify the certificate and activate the device, such that users do not have to, have to manually activate devices. As the device comes up, it sends traffic the first time. The certificate that's associated is, not, is um, recognizable by the cloud, and it's able to activate the device and brings it up. The SIG principle here deals with what I refer to as not allowing transitive authorization. It's more of a general principle, which means that an IoT system administrator has to actively grant authority, and in such a system, the use anyone who needs authority must be able to request authority. The seventh principle has to, speaks to runtime anomaly detection and device health checks. And the message being that in an IoT scenario, using machine learning, we should be able to detect with what if our IoT devices are behaving wrongly. So examples that we use here will be CPU usage. Um, for instance, we often have IoT devices being attractive for crypto uh, digital currency mining because they're always on. So if, if for instance, I, I'm able to attack an IoT device, I don't necessarily even care sometimes about the data I might just care about the compute power that it provides. But now, if depending on the workloads you're running on your IoT devices, you should be able to just, um, get a sense of how much CPU usage you expect 
Um, another example would be even the traffic over the network interface. Um, and in this case, I'm saying, okay, for instance, if we're only expecting to get a few kilobytes of, of um, data from the IoT device and we realize that each IoT device is processing 10 times that amount of data over the network interface card, then there's a problem. So really just talking about runtime and model detection, especially even in this cloud to edge device type scenarios. Then we also want to ensure that the IoT admins are able to seamlessly revoke authority. So picking back off that scenario that I just described, whereby I'm, ru I'm running this edge device, I've got this IoT cloud, and this applies in any scenario, whether it be agriculture, smart homes, or smart cities. If I'm able to, with principle seven, ensure that I'm monitoring some particular metrics of the IoT device regarding CPU usage, for instance, or the traffic that is going on the network interface card, and then I discover that I'm processing the network interface card 10 times more in terms of the amount of traffic than I expect the IoT device to be sending, then if the system is probably set up, it should be easy for, an, for the IoT system administrator to deactivate the certificate um, ensuring that the IoT device is not able to communicate with the rest of the network or the cloud. The ninth principle, super simple here, is just about keeping secrets secret. And why do I say that? In terms, it's usually most users will be, shall I say, gladdened by not having to worry about how they manage secrets. So as security professionals, you know if the secrets are better kept in hardware, or if they're better kept in software, and if they're, even if they're kept in software, which software is appropriate? So putting it super simply, I'm not dragging it out longer, let's keep the secret secret by default tied to the first principle. Most users don't want to, if most users don't have to worry about it, they'll be thankful for it. The last one speaks to circumvention of security controls. Um, some research also in the deck from um, Koppel and Smith, and one other person whose name I forget right now, speaks to the systematic circumvention of security controls by users. We often measure, with regards to metrics, how our products or the features that we develop are used. The question then becomes, what about how they are misused? In an IoT type scenario, um, if we're sending updates to an IoT device, and we realize that the updates are not being applied, the question then is why? So if users will systematically circumvent security controls, how do we not waste the crisis or waste the problem and use that to improve security controls? So for instance, with an update on IoT device, if it so happens that the updates are taking too long, most likely what's gonna happen? What do you think? Will it be turned off? It will be turned off. There's this really short story about an IoT device that was um, that was compromised, and they had to deploy. I, I think uh, perhaps to deploy um, the, if, if, um, the operating system in re real time to that IoT device. Really trying to deploy the software that brings the device back up, but they were using a channel that could only pro process a few kilobytes a minute. So that's an, a unique scenario with IoT devices whereby, okay, if people are turning off updates, just as an example, um, why are they turning off updates? In closing, the challenge, or more, or better put, shall I say, the, the ask will be aiming for simplicity and clarity. Now, in art speak, as I put it, um, Leonardo da Vinci, this quote of, often, this quote often attributed to him states that simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. But I dare say in engineers speak, we're more likely to say, keep it simple, stupid, or keep it stupid, simple. And I think both are saying the same thing. Um, if we, if we look at our security, the security features that we're developing, we're aiming for, shall I say, simplicity, um, leads us down the path of less bugs as was in the previous talk. I don't know if you guys were here. And the long story short on this deck is that both the artists who are saying that simplicity is ultimate sophistication and the engineer who says keep it simple stupid, in both cases what they're both doing is art. Secure design is art. Um, and we want to aim for simplicity and clarity 
for ourselves as we build and then for the users who are making use of such features or products. We've got a few more things on security usability in this book on IoT, uh, the IoT architecture, security, and privacy. There are some resources here that I've got in the link with regards to the convention of security controls and the systematic approach um, that users will often take if it becomes a hindrance, um, talking about how we get usable security, um, as well as um, the, shall we say, des other design principles for usable security. Some network, social networking information, and that's all. Any questions? Before we go to questions, first uh, applause for Ding Wei. Any questions? Yeah. Here you go. So you might want to correct me if I'm wrong, but from what I understood, a lot of IoT devices are battery powers or are not connected to a power network, let's say. And some of your uh, suggestions to improve the security, for example, continuous monitoring, I'd imagine takes quite some battery power. Is Do you envision that your principle should be put on all devices, or is it more a nuanced vision where, sure, if you have a lot of power, you can always monitor this device, but maybe sometimes we have to trade off usability uh, of the device itself, not even like usability of the for the for the client or for the user, but just for example, I don't know, uh, a sensor at a farmer's place. If he has to recharge the batteries every, let's say, week, uh, that might be difficult, right? Yeah, that's a great point with regards to the fact that some IoT devices just don't have the, shall we say, the power to always be on and to be processing, uh, to allow you to process, um, to, to run monitoring and, and take that to the cloud. But the short answer there would be the gateway layer. So for instance, if one has, that's why rather than have multiple, uh, even though, you, even if your sensor is able to process things, um, if you, you don't want to have multiple de devices always on and always running and consuming power, but if you have the gateways then where you're uploading traffic to the cloud, where you're sending stuff to the sensors, and then there you're doing, there's an opportunity to do monitoring um, at, with fewer devices that are more likely to have power. Anybody else with your question? No. Um, hi, one question. I don't know, this is a little more hardware specific, but uh, a lot of secure designs to some extent rely on having a good hardware trust anchor. Um, I know that there are currently alternatives to normal TPMs under discussion, for example, the usage of SRAM puffs. Um, do you have any experiences with such alternatives like what the, you like in practice see of advantages and disadvantages? Oh, my short answer there would be, would be no. Um, so, uh, to, and to keep it simple as well, like I just said, um, in terms of TPMs, yes, but the alternatives, and are you asking specifically to security usability for those alternatives? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And no, this is, um, like for IoT devices, you normally don't have the budget for really deploying TPMs. Um, so, like, for example, S1 Paths is an alternative which, as far as I know, is an idea of having um, something that's easier to manufacture than a full TPM. Um, but the question is not so much related to, to usability, but on the actual security that they provide. Well, that would depend on the use case. And what you're trying, what, um, what you're trying to store in this case without the device, um, is it better? Is it, is, is it even workable at all if it's stored in software? Um, and when you say TPM, hardware based TPM, right? Yeah, only hardware would like what you use for storing the according public keys for secure boot and also for the key material that you use for TLS. So the private key that the client or the device uses to authenticate. Okay. In, in that case, my answer will be that there are, shall we say, different standards that try to reduce, um, uh, if we were to answer properly, different standards that try to reduce the, but I, as I answer, I'm, I realize I don't fully understand the question. Is the, is the challenge the, the IoT device not supporting the TPMs or not having the processor power to support the TPMs or? Yeah. So talking about alternative, like cheaper alternatives to TPMs. Ah, okay. Let me answer simply. I'm not aware. Okay, no problem. I know 
I don't know if it's cheaper or not. How you can build uh, um, software? Um, software secure element. Uh, can Can you repeat? Sorry. Um, I'm <laughs> so, so I'm I'm not I'm not the hardware expert here. I'm rather the the software expert. But if we're talking about storing um, keys and so on, uh, this can be done in in software by using something that's called white box technology. Yeah. So you basically build a, a, a safe storage or, or a secured storage in software, and this is portable across wherever you deploy. <laughs> Sorry? On white box cryptography mainly based. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I know about HCE, so. Yeah. Yeah, so in HCE, it's, it's, there's a, a lot of white box, different white boxes used, yeah. So I think that's, uh, I don't know if it's cheaper or not than some hardware um, solutions, but it's it's very usable anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Pat, Thank you. for this edition. Anybody else? Here we go. One question about the um, kill switch slash revocation of trust in a device. Um, what's the expected behavior there? Because if it's no longer owned by me and it's attacking others in a botnet or something like that, is the standard recommendation to do something about that? Or is it tough out of luck? Now we have millions of more computers out there spamming and being remotely controlled by others? Well, the, 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 my, the first thing would be trying to ensure the device is not able to compromise whatever objective that the system is trying to make. So if one is uh, able to, turn, to deactivate the device certificate, so it's not able to communicate with the cloud, so that addresses that problem. But I'm, I think you're talking about a larger problem, which is then what is the device also able to do um, since an attacker has got hold of it. Am I right? So I, as a vendor, no longer trust that known malicious yes. client, uh, which I hopefully didn't do in the first place. Yeah. And then, uh, but now the device is out there still and doing bad stuff. Okay. The, yeah. The, the, the short answer will be one will still have to take the device off the network manually, right? Or just make sure it's unable to, to, um, use the network at all. So the first, the first step with the device certificate is ensuring that it cannot compromise the system. Um, but also that takes us to, a to another angle, which is how do you deactivate the, sys the device completely and turn it off? Yeah. Is so that I, right? I, I, the, the word kill switch is basically what I was looking for. I mean, that would be nice, but then uh, users will actually notice because if, if I'm a user that isn't comfortable with security and all of that stuff and I just want to want that stuff to work, then... Uh, how do I know that I have to take it online, um, offline? It's still probably doing some of the work that I was expecting. Okay, okay. That, there are multiple questions in that question, which is how do I turn the device off, perhaps? Um, or how do I still leverage some of the computation within the device that is still useful to me? How do I extract that out? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. So how, how do I disable it effectively? Uh, just not revoke it? Uh, the trust in it, but can I disable it if I know that I? If you have a if you have a secure means of controlling that device, um, so for instance, there are some devices that have um, con manageability at the chip level, for instance. So if you have manageability at a chip level, you might be able to turn it off. But also depends on the scenario or on the device if it has that feature. So to answer your question succinctly, depending on the features that one has got on the device, can you actually turn it off if you still have um, a trusted channel to the device outside of just the operating system whereby you are using that, for instance, to do regular updates and command and control? Okay. So, thank you. Thanks. Time for the last question, or was this it? Yes? Sort of uh, the opposite question, I guess. What if you're a user and you're not comfortable with uh, a device that you've bought and own having a kill switch that, you know, some a company could re remotely switch off and, you know, your device stops working and you're in so trouble? And to echo, to echo the question so that we, so to make sure I understand it. So what if you're a user and you're not comfortable with people having access to turn off your device? Right? Um, 
That is an interesting question. It's an ethical question with regards to IoT in general, the control that are in the hands of the manufacturers. Um, and to answer your question, so is your question, let me make sure I get the kernel. Is your question, what do you do then, or is that right, or? Yeah, essentially. It, or or sh do you think the the manufacturers should have that ability, or should we have some sort of control or controls to prevent abuse of that ability to turn off devices remotely, for example? I think it becomes a, a combination. Like, you, um, if I if I were to lean into what you're saying of technical and even regulatory controls, uh, because you want an extent, for instance, the manufacturer has to have some ability to monitor and update the device, especially in a scenario whereby the users are most likely not going to be doing that or have the time mm -hmm. or the expertise to do that. So let's consider a smart city scenario whereby you've got devices at intersections, you've got cars, you've got trains, and there are two devices everywhere. Um, how do you update those devices? In fact, I dare say that they're most likely, like you have it with... Um, with a mobile platform, you know, there's a likelihood that you're going to have a business that de uh, a business mo uh, that develops for just updating devices and making sure they're updated correctly. So I think there is no running away from that because the devices still need to be updated. Um, the question then becomes, how do we address the ethical question or concerns of users? Combination of technical controls, regulatory standards, things like that, which are still being worked on. Thank you. Thank you very much then, for okay, this presentation. And I wanted to say, I wanted to to say, say okay. this last thing, just um, so it's not just about me. Thanks for, for making time. I hope it was useful. Thanks for coming to the conference. Thanks for hanging out here. So the last hands or applause I say for yourselves. Please give yourselves a hand.